forward. I just wanted to start off with a few thank yous to a lot of the people that are helping this organization and as we move forward with things. Starting off as our MLS SAD officers. So I serve as the president, Craig Thompson as our president elect, Kathy Urchel, our vice president, Suzanne Robson, our treasurer, and David Dines as our immediate past president. So thanks to all of you for all that you do and all the meetings that you attend to help out this organization. The rest of our board of directors, Cindy Glass, Jim Bowman, Kim Clifton, Kristen Cole, Greg Curtis, Martha Kotlowski, and Kelly Ann, thank you. Then our committees, they do a lot of work for us on evaluating and looking at things, giving recommendations to our board of directors. Our standards committee, Lisa Sullivan's our chair, Andy Barmore is our vice chair. And then we have Nicole Brule Fisher, Patrick Devine, Amanda Elmer, Diana Fenney, Mark Gilliland, Melinda Maddox, Laura Mance, Heather McLaren, Maria Powell, Michael Smith, and Cheryl Turbening. All these people are contributing their time and expertise on a regular basis to help us proceed further as an organization. Our technology committee, Kelly Hands is our chair, Jacob Friedman is our vice chair, and then Andy Barmore, Bridget Berry, Lori Lundin, Robert Neely, Brittany Palma, Robert Redding, John Smith, Waco Star, and Tom Williams. So, Thanks for all that they do to help our organization and taking time out of their business and their schedules to help proceed and, and continue to make us a better organization for our members. In addition, I want to thank our MLS staff. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for what they do. I, I was a staff person for many years ago at MLS, and they do a tremendous job for us. And I want us to always thank them whenever we can for the great job that they do. Um, when your staff or volunteer organization, things change a lot, the leaders change a lot, and you're turning on a dime as you need to help everyone. So Andrew Castillo, our director of MLS policy and compliance, Kaylo, Caitlin McCon, excuse me, the Commons, who's also in compliance now, Amy Maloney, our training system support specialist, Brian Ornis Organ, our director of MLS technology, Benjamin Hernandez in tech support, Hayden Miller also in tech support. And Scott Moog is data and system administrator, and our Nutt Tamayo and technical support as well. All these people are here for us day in, day out. Let's take a minute and give them a hand if we would. All right, we've got some updates and things we want to make sure you've got the latest information on what's going on. I'm going to touch on first a few of the NAR mandated rules we adopted earlier this year. I want to make sure everyone's clear on them. And if there's any questions, I can answer them. And then we'll talk about some other changes that are coming as well. So first of all, rules regarding co-op fees. So one of the things that happened earlier this year is we removed the search criteria so that you can no longer search by co-op fee. Now, all of these co-op fee changes came from NAR. And a lot of them were with the Department of Justice as they were negotiating back and forth and trying to deal with antitrust and all kinds of things. So NAR said, let's just go ahead and do this. And so that's one of them is you can't search by it. We now display the co-op fee on the MLS public website. So anybody coming to search for listings there sees the co-op fee. It also displays on the Flex MLS listing detail page when you print it out and hand your clients that has the co-op fee. It's full disclosure of who's getting paid and what they're being paid so everyone's aware of that. The other optional piece to this is that for brokers and agents on your own website, you're not forced to display it, but you have the option to display it. So in each of the data feeds to your vendors, they can turn that on if you want them to. There is a disclaimer that has to go to it next to it. So it's clear what that is when you display it, but realize you have that option, but you're gonna see that more and more out there and just be aware of that. And if uh, clients have questions, you know what that is and can explain it to them. Any questions on the co-op fee piece? Any questions online? Okay, I'll keep going here. The next one that we implemented was another rule um, from NAR that was mandated was an address being required on residential listings. So for all residential listings, an address is required. If there is no address yet, then the tax ID is required. If there is no tax ID yet, 
then you must have a very clear detailed legal description so it's very clear exactly what that property is now as a reminder as brokers and agents you still have the ability even though you're putting an address into mls there is the option to hide that address when it goes out on the internet so you can hide it from other brokers and agent websites for idx you can hide it for realtor.com but then it still displays inside the system for agents so just making sure what controls you've got if there's some confidentiality or other things you know what you can do and have the flexibility to be able to offer another one of the mandated rules was no filtering of listings to the consumer based on agents or companies so you can't say here's my website but i'm eliminating this company's listings aren't i'm not going to show or this agent's listings i'm not going to show if you are going to display the mls for people to search you must be all of the mls and everyone that's authorized the listings to be there you can't pick and choose to eliminate certain companies. Hopefully that's not an issue already, but NAR was just making sure that, that was very clear um, out there with everything that's going on. The other piece is just making sure, once again, on full disclosure, that we're not promoting services as free if there's any competition from any other source whatsoever. So you can't call it free unless there's no financial compensation coming from another party, from somewhere else along the line, making sure what you what you uh, throw it out there and the information that they get. So the next one, this is one that has not been implemented yet. And we talked about it earlier in the year. We now got details we can share with you. This is one that is a big change in the MLS and so we need to make sure that everyone's aware of what's coming. It's due by the National Association of Realtors, but we will in the next coming months give you a firm date we finalize the plans of the MLS of when this will be implemented. So what this change has to do with the listing office contact information showing up on IDX websites. So on broker and agent websites, there's always been the requirement, not only from the MLS, but from the Department of Real Estate that you show who the listing brokerage is of that listing. So it's very clear to the consumer, it's not your listing, it's someone else's listing that you have on there. The additional change here is that there's a requirement that if you're showing IDX listings on your website, that you must show either a phone number or email address that that brokerage has specified on the listing along with the name. So it's full disclosure of who the listing office is, but that you do have the opportunity to reach out direct on a specific question. Now, this is the first time that this has been in place. This is one of the, once again, NAR has given us this rule. We're implementing it as we're required to do. But here's how it will work at a brokerage level. First, at a brokerage level, you will decide as a brokerage, do we want to specify one specific email and phone number across all the brokerages listing? That's one option you have as a brokerage. The other option you have is you can say, I'm going to designate this to the listing agent, that the listing agent can put what phone number or email. This decision will be made at a brokerage level and every one of our member brokerages. So they choose whether the brokerage sets a default that it's across everything or whether they enable it for each agent to be able to put that information in. And then that's what will show up next to the listing company name on all the websites that are out there across all the brokers and agents. So let me show you some examples of the screens that may help explain this a little more. So this is the control for the broker. As a designated broker, there's an option that's right here where you can specify make broker attribution active. That's where you say, yes, I wanna make sure that my phone, I have a phone number or email that will show up on the listings as they show up on other sites. If you do, then you have two options. You set a default email address or phone number that's going to show up across all your listings 100 that will be what shows on there the other option that you have as a broker is to designate it to the listing member if you choose designate it to the listing member then they choose each listing member chooses whether it's a phone number or an email and which one it is on those listings it can't be a website address it can't be a marketing slogan it's going to be checked to make sure it's a phone number or email address only when it goes in there. And so on the listing side, there will be a field called broker attribution. Now, this will be there if the broker's already decided they're not giving the option to those agents, it's not going to let you change or do anything with it here. If they've given the control to the listing agent, 
then what it will do here is as an agent, this is nice, you can set your own default so you don't have to put it in every time of whether you want your phone number or your email to show up. But on a listen by listen basis, you could change this. So if you were working on a team and somebody was going to hand, it's going to be under one agent, but another agent is going to be handling it, um, you've got flexibility to do that. So this change will be coming in the next few months. As a reminder, with these inquiries, they still should be going to somebody that's licensed. So you're following the Department of Real Estate of how people are answering inquiries and things as they come through. But this is a change that's coming in um, in the next few months. One of the things we're going to have to do as we work out this timeline is make sure we give all the website vendors enough time. because They've got to make changes to their sites so that it has a place to display that contact information. Any questions on this? Any question? Judy, please. Yes, and I would like to make sure that the brokerage name is still going to appear as it is listed at the Arizona Department of Real Estate. So this doesn't change the requirement that the listing brokerage display. Now it'll display whatever the MLS name is. So as long as the MLS is make sure the brokerage name is the same in MLS as it is with the Department of Real Estate, but that's where the source of that name display is, is whatever is in MLS. And then that would display there. But yes, that still is a requirement. You're not, there's no requirement to display the listing agent. It's the listing brokerage and whatever contact information field that broker has supplied or their agent has supplied for following up. Yes. What is uh, something like zillowbroker.com all of those that sell preferred agent positions? It has this in effect to them. So, they're a little different. So Zillow is a brokerage. They will follow this exactly like any other brokerage. So all of our member brokerages all have to follow the same rules. Realtor.com is not a member brokerage. They're just an advertising site. So they will still do whatever they do. But um, one of the things that we've always done is our rules affect everyone. So no matter what company it is, no matter what business model it is, no matter what, everyone will follow these same rules um, and the information will be required to display. Ellen. Would it be important to point out uh, that the phone number and email that is displayed goes to a uh, realtor and not somebody unlicensed? Yeah, to Kelly's point, making sure that whoever's answering that number or that email is somebody that is through the product of estate licensed and able to do so, that they're not getting listing information from an unlicensed person. Cheryl? Sure. Okay. <laughs> So with what you just said, being licensed, do they have to be licensed in this state? This is going to fall back on ADRA rules of how listings are answered. So that really that answer is not an MLS answer. It's how any person can answer um, a question about a listing in, in Arizona. Judy, maybe you've got <laughs> from the Department of Real Estate side of that. It has to be an Arizona real estate licensee that is giving out information on an Arizona listing. And that's Does that right. answer your question? I just want to know if it's written somewhere. In the statutes of Arizona. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, so that would be an ADRE rule, not an MLS rule, but that over obviously over encompasses everything. JT. Well, Oh, I think I can bellow loud. <laughs> uh, I was curious if you would give us an explanation as to the rationale behind these changes. <laughs> so, once again, this is handed down by NAR, so I've got limited information. It's my understanding it was more on the whole disclosure side to make sure it's very clear. Um, and if that someone doesn't think the other company is a listing broker, and if they need to reach out and verify something on the listing or something, they've got a path to get there. Now, it doesn't have to be clickable or anything like that. It's just a text display disclosure required um, as part of that. I don't have more. There was a lot of discussion at NAR about this. Um, at first, it was supposed to be implemented in March of this year, and they delayed it to September. But now it, it's coming. Um, and the, what's, what finally happened is the vendors like Flex MLS has got their plan in place, which is the screenshots we looked at of, of how that will take place in the system. Any other questions? Any questions from our group online? 
Okay, I hear quiet. We'll keep going. So we want to talk a little bit about MLS data accuracy and rules enforcement. So some of the feedback we've heard over the last year or two has been a few different things. One, hey, I keep finding inaccurate data in the MLS. Something's wrong on listings. Why isn't that information right? So that was one piece of information that we worked with. Um, another piece has been, well, how come all of you do MLS says they rely on other members to report everything? How come they can't find things on themselves? You know, MLS find if there's inaccurate information. So that was another piece of feedback we worked through. And then I was looking at the enforcement procedures. And we look to see the staff have enough resources to be able to do that. Do they have the tools that will help them do that? And so those three things we looked at last year and this year um, as we've been kind of moving forward to really take a look at what can we do? Because we know one of the number one things we do as an MLS is we provide accurate data. And if we don't have accurate data, nobody wins. The consumer doesn't win, the agents don't win. And so for all of us, it's important that there's accurate data in the MLS system. So there's a couple steps that we are taking to move forward and, and help address some of this. One of these first ones is the list. There's a new tool that we're going to be having as an MLS called the Listing Data Checker Tool. And there's three components to this that I kind of kind of walk through with you. The first one is an error prevention tool. Wouldn't it be nice if we could catch things right when the listing went in instead of someone finding it later? So with the error prevention tool, there's a tool that the agents and brokers can use that when they put the listing in. They will check it against public data and other information and look for anything that looks wrong right at the get-go. So that's going to help in itself. Let's, let's fix it before it becomes a problem. And so that um, error prevention tool will be there as we move forward. We don't have a timeline on this tool yet. It's going to be a number of months as we work on getting it set up and implemented, but it's something the board has approved and we're moving forward with. The second piece of this is error discovery. So back to the why do agents have to report everything? In addition to having that error prevention tool in the beginning, this system has a tool where it will go out and look at data that's on listings and compare it to public records and other places to see if it sees anything suspect, even after the listing has gone in. So this will allow that, you know, if someone's putting wrong square footage or some of the other things in there, rather than waiting, is some agent gonna find this and report it, that the system says, ah, we got an issue and can help address that. So that in itself will help more things get discovered and more accurate data as we move forward. The third part of this listing data checker tool is the follow-up management. And this is really giving staff better tools where this, there's a system that actually manages any potential violations or inaccurate information, can send out reminders and requests to get things fixed. It will look for repeat offenders of people that are routinely having problems that need maybe addressed a little differently. And so that becomes the third part of this listing data checker tool is giving staff the best tools available so that they can help reinforce the importance of that accurate information. So the standards committee reviewed this, um, our tech committee took a look at it too and felt with data accuracy being one of the things we do, what, what's more important than doing everything we can to ensure that. And we really like the idea of for brokers, let's not, we're not about finding violations, we're not finding people, let's give them tools to look right up front when they put the listing so we can address some of those things in front of that and get those taken care of. So in addition to that listing data checker tool, the other piece that we did is looked at our policy 39, which is our whole rules enforcement procedure. We wanted to make sure is this current, it was done many years ago, and let's look at where we're at today. And what are the rules that we have in place? Is there ways that we can better manage the expectations and requirements that we have out there? And so a task force got formed um, to do with that review of those rules and how they're enforced. And a new policy has been approved by the board of directors. I'm gonna ask Andrew Castillo, um, our director of MLS policy and compliance to come up and just talk a little bit about what's new in policy 39 and see if you have any questions, and then I'll keep going from there. Hello. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate that, and I appreciate your leadership this year. It's been, uh, what an amazing time to be at the MLS. I have seen this evolution of compliance from going from 
errors being submitted and taking it to a committee and adjudicated on a, on a um, uh, individual basis to all of a sudden that we're getting this great tool that's modern. 70% um, of MLSs are now using this. So it's just, it's an amazing time. And part of that evolution process is the policy 39. Um, it's one of those things where we understood that um, you know, it needed to be streamlined a little bit, needed to be updated. And I'm um, so thankful for the, uh, the Policy 39 Task Force and all the work that they did um, in helping put this together. So um, it's an eight-page document. Um, the full details is on the MLS website uh, under the governing doc. So you can go there right now. And in case you didn't know, all of our policy statements are there. Our bylaws are there, the rules and regs, and the uh, corrections and compliance policy. Um, that is all underneath the government docs tab on the website. So you can see the full detail there. It's an eight page document. So I, what I presented was an overview, what I felt was what you really needed to know um, and what are the most important changes. So um, the effective date of the policy is going to be August the 1st. This is when this policy actually goes into action. Um, and then there's going to be a 90 day educational period. So that means for the next 90 days after August 1st, um, there's going to be in stake in fines, at least in, uh, administrative fines. Um, so everyone gets used to the way that we're, we're now doing things. Um, it's important to note that whenever you submit a complaint to the MLS, that it's completely anonymous and it's going to stay anonymous. And um, you know, that's one of a, one of our core tenants that people should feel free to go ahead and um, if they need to submit a complaint, that uh, that fear of retribution won't be there. So we're going to keep our complaint process in office. Um, the need to act expeditiously um, was something that uh, I felt that, um, and, and so did our members felt that, we really need some improvement on. And so in this case, that MLS can take steps to uh, remove listing information, to correct listing information, if we can verify that information is, is credible. So in the case of maybe some fair housing language that's in a property description, um, MLS staff will go ahead and remove that information, will notify the listing participant and the listing member, um, letting them know what action was taken. Um, but this is a great tool to have because if you submit a complaint about maybe something in the contract is incorrect, we can take a look at that purchase contract and verify the information and make the updates that we need or that's necessary to get that listing as accurate as possible. Um, something you'll need to know is that notices will go out to the uh, email that's inside of Flex to the listing participant and the listing agent. Um, the due date for those has changed from two business days to three calendar days. So it's very important to understand within three calendar days, that um, the, our notification needs to be addressed, whether that's, hey, you need to find a little bit more information or we're trying to validate the information that we have in there. Um, the point is that it needs to be addressed within three calendar days. So those will be going out and uh, the subject line for those notifications will be compliance notification, time sensitive. So that way you know it's coming from us. And um, if you have any questions, um, we get a lot of phone calls each day of having to explain, you know, what, what the notification actually says. Um, so you can always give us a call and we can explain it in detail. Um, accountability. So I, I, with this new policy, I think there's greater accountability. Uh, so in this case, if the violation goes unaddressed, so there's no response, um, what will happen is that a fine will be issued um, on the, uh, so on the fourth day, so you get three days and on the fourth day, a fine will be issued. If there's still no response and the violation remains inside the MLS, so you still got incorrect information out there, uh, what will happen is um, after three calendar days, another violation will be issued. And that's a $200 fine for, non, uh, for, for being non-responsive. Um, and then it brings us down to our repeat offenders. So with this, uh, for the folks that are making the, the same mistakes, 
that haven't sought out the education to correct those, uh, those errors. Um, the repeat offender uh, process was, uh, was bolstered. And so now at three violations, three fines, excuse me, three fines of the same type um, uh, of, uh, uh, of listing errors, the agent will be required to attend a hearing with the standards committee. So they'll go to the standards committee, explain what happened, why they made the error. The standards committee will help to explain um, what the expectations are. And they may be able to provide further sanctions or further education. It just all depends on, on, the, on the merits of the situation. Something important for you to know is that at six and 12 violations, the participants in the program will be required to attend a hearing and um, help explain, you know, why they got to the point where their agent has got six to twelve uh, or six or twelve uh, sanctions within that year. And these go by calendar years as well, so it's measured, you know, whether you get three, six, or twelve of those uh, fines each year. That's uh, that's the cutoff point. So each calendar year, and then we want to make sure that. Um, everyone has their day. It has the day to explain what's happened. Um, so any fines are, uh, or decisions are appealable. And if the fine is issued from staff administratively, that can be appealed to the standards committee. If the standards committee has made a decision, that can be appealed to the MLS board of directors. So that's a lot to take in. I'm happy to take any questions right now. Good morning. Hey Mark. Is this on? Yeah. Oh, okay. And thank you and Jim and, and all of the people with MLS for everything they are doing. This, this system is only as good as, as we are. It's all about the data. My question it, uh, refers to the bullet uh, about accountability. I'm wondering if you if you mean a different word. If the violation means unresolved or fails to appeal, you mean on appeal or upon appeal? What do you mean fail to appeal? That they fail to appeal their violation? Sure. Um, yeah. So you know, what if you get a, a correction notice from the MLS, right? And you feel that it's it, um, we're not able to come to an agreement that the MLS position is. This seems very factual that you have the incorrect information and the, uh, the listing broker is unable to, to provide any kind of proof of yeah. the information, right? So at that point, they can appeal that decision. Right. And then that decision will go up to the standards committee. Um, so in this case, um, you know, they have to be accountable by answering the notification. Maybe it's just a grammatical thing, but I think it should say uh, or fails upon appeal. Okay. So just a suggestion. Thank you. On your uh, repeat offenders, the calendar year, are you starting January 1 to January, January 1, or does the calendar start at the first violation and go a year from that first violation? January to December is the calendar year. So you can, you can have somebody violate three times in December, and then January starts all over and starts to slate clean. Correct. So the question was, uh, if anybody on Zoom didn't hear that, um, you know, was the, uh, the corrections process and the repeat offenders, how do they add up throughout the year? And it's based on calendar year from January to December. Anybody else? Any questions online? Yes, I do online. Um, what was the fine on the fourth day? Okay, so inside of that, so I would invite you to go to um, the MLS website, mlssaz.com, uh -huh. and look at the government docs so you can get the full schedule of fines. Okay, gotcha. Is that each rule now has its own fine, minimum fine associated with it so that you can get an idea of if I break this rule, what's go, what's the penalty for it? At least just to begin with. Uh, if you start racking up at least three or more 
finds the same type of uh, uh, violation, let's say uh, you've gotten the, the buyer's agent incorrect at least four times, on the fourth time, that fine doubles according to whatever the, uh, the fee structure is, the schedule of fines. Okay, and I do have a second question. Um, on, where did I have it? Sorry, taking notes. So under the, the LDCT that is going in place, you know, and it's looking for the problem and whatnot. Um, I've noticed in when I'm doing listings that CRS and the county don't always match up. Um, I normally go with the county, but would that be one of those situations where you send out a notice and I contact you back and I say, well, there was a discrepancy and I went with the county. Is that is that what you mean by responding and giving you where we got what we got? Precisely, great example. Um, part of this and part with the listing data checkers to help improve the accuracy of our courthouse retrieval system. So taking a look at where the inconsistencies are. And by the way, if you do ever see incorrect information versus what we have in CRS versus what's in the county records, we encourage you to report that to us because then we can start to piece together where are the gaps, where are we missing and why is the information inconsistent between the two? Then we can help to improve the system for everybody. So yes, thank you. That would have been the best response if you would have received a, a notification like that. Perfect. Thank you. And do you have a comment? Oh, got one more question uh, here live. One it says violations should be rolling 12 months. Otherwise, members can offend towards the end of the year and not be held accountable the following year. Um, I'm sorry, speak up just a little bit more. I apologize. Violations should be rolling 12 months. Otherwise, members can offend towards the end of the year and not be held accountable the following year. Thank you. Uh, something that the task force did discuss. Um, in our experience that we haven't seen a rush to offend at the, you know, December and then knowing, you know, January, they have a free, free slate, you know, to make it break as many rules as possible. You got to remember once you have broken and receive three fines, you're gonna to go to a standards committee here. And so even if it is that they decide to break three rules in December and they break another three or get up to at least three in January, there's gonna be some accountability there and they'll be going to a hearing and those hearings are fun. Um, you have to go and you have to, uh, and there may be people that you've heard of in the room and, um, you know, you have to go, essentially I'm saying you have to go before a jury of peers and uh, be accountable for what's happened. Any other questions? All right. So my question is, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the verifiable versus non-verifiable uh, penalty and how that plays? Um, so the question was to talk about a little bit how the process, um, how we validate some of the errors. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the detail. Um, I want to be respectful of time, but I will tell you that there's going to be errors that we can verify either through uh, county records or uh, even uh, uh, contracts that we'll use that information to validate what's in the MLS. And if it's incorrect, we can update it. In some cases, there are going to be some, some stuff that we can't verify on our desk. Number of bedrooms, number of garage spaces. Those are all good examples of, of things that we can't verify then and there. So we're going to reach out to the listing agent and listing broker. Within three business days, we're going to ask for you to provide a response to us. Um, under the verifiable violations, uh, there are automatic fines now. And those are under this uh, schedule of fines. And that if the MLS is going to have to update the listing and correct it, uh, a fine will be issued. 
and that fine is, and like it says here, it's due within 30 days. Our, um, our due dates are very similar now to how, uh, to how dues are set up, where you have to pay within 30 days, and if not for non-payment, uh, may result in services being shut off. Yes. I have to be familiar with the specialist. Um, and my question is, since we are surrounding counties, when we, uh, as she had mentioned about the, the differences between the GIS and, you know, et cetera, are, will you guys make the effort to say it's in Santa Cruz County because their system is different? Are, are, will you work towards updating their systems as much as Pima County? It'll be across the board. Um, right now, CRS is providing information for the whole state of Arizona. So and we want to be able to encompass that. Um, so yes, it, it'll be across the board having improvements to, to CRS, not just for Pima County, but everywhere where we have listings. And we have listings throughout the state of Arizona. Thank you. Any other is there a list of verifiable data points that you'll be working from that you can share? That would be on the uh, schedule of fines. It's actually broken out into variable, verifiable type violations and non-verifiable type. They're not going to be all inclusive um, because it's, I think it's hard to uh, put on paper all the various types of violations that could possibly happen, but it gives you a really good idea and it um, it captures our entire rules and regs. So for each rules and reg or every rule, there's some kind of sign, uh, fine or um, sanction associated with it. So we're not talking about uh, data points like a tax ID number only. You're talking about their housing. And it, it doesn't get as granular. Homes. Yeah, it doesn't get as granular as a tax ID, but it that would be covered under listing data accuracy. You know, so that's just a kind of a, uh, a, a catch-all in a way. And then there's other things that say um, what the actual, what the zoning is. So part of the work that the task force did is they took a look at what were the, well, what were the rules? What were the most serious rules that were being broken? What were the ones that um, didn't qualify for such a severe type of, penalty and a few like the um, zoning that came up um, even the flood zone those uh, were signed I think I believe it was a $25 fine something around those lines and then for the more serious violations like a fair housing those fines escalated quite a bit thank you can I guess the mic in the meeting sure okay, uh, if we have time we have Mindy and Mike Matt Okay, quick question, uh, because I've experienced this. Uh, for example, the agent up in Phoenix with a piece of land here, and I, he's got down that there's a well, and then actually there is no well. So then I inform him after doing the research, there's no well. I've had this happen several times. There is no well. Well, the owner told me there's a well, so I have to put it in the MLS. So, at what point do you define what you're being told by an owner that's may you know may not have done their research versus the agent of what goes into the MLS? Sure. To me, that comes down back to the agent's uh, due diligence. You know, the agent. Yeah, I, okay. it belongs to ultimately rest on the shoulders of the broker, and that's why now they're having to. If you're getting a, a certain amount of violations or fines each year, they're having to come down mm -hmm. to be part of this hearing process. Or whatever, if the spuds is different, then your aid, the agent can inform your client. This is the research that I found in their correction. That's right. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of errors and omissions claims um, that they wanted to defend themselves with a, the seller told me this but I don't think that relieves the actual agent from the responsibility of verifying the information that we're inputting. Okay. Do we have time for one more? One more. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to know um, how many violations 
profit so far and and the, the amount of the money for science and research. Um, so part about this is that with this whole overhaul um, is that we provide a report, some stats on the fines that are being issued out each month, the types of violations that we're seeing and what the results were. And even the fact that um, the violations that we get that turn out to be non-actual or the complaints that we get that turn out to be non-violations. So inside of our stats, you'll be seeing more information and a breakdown of each month I can't give you the numbers for the entire year right now, um, but I believe last month in about 20 days, so it's our working days, uh, we corrected um, uh, 500 listings. And so that may be multiple corrections for each listing, but at least 500. That's incredible. We get about 350 to 400 uh, people hitting the report error button each month. I'm glad I'm not a designated broker. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be more information about this to come, um, but I want to provide you with an overview of what's coming up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. A couple quick things on this. Um, obviously, the stands to me is me watching this new policy closely, and, and the, part of this reason for this period of, of easing it in is seeing how it all works. And if any adjustments need to be made and the board will stay in close communication with standards on that. The other thing to clarify is while these new processes, we have that delay, that doesn't mean there's no fines for the next 90 days for doing anything. You know, if you lend your key, you don't have a free pass to do so in the next 90 days. It will still be handled uh, under our old policy. All right, uh, let me give you a quick update on show and serve. We talked about this at the beginning of the year. Um, our contract is coming up for renewal with Show and Time. We've had our technology committee very involved and appreciate doing extra meetings every month to review a number of different showing service providers. They have sent their recommendations to the board of directors for review. And now in the state we're in is the board is doing its due diligence along with staff on some investigation and a number of different things. Um, we'll have more detail once that due diligence is complete and the negotiations are. So I just want to let you know that's still an in-process piece, and a lot of good work's been done by our tech committee and now finishing up between the board and staff on any recommendations moving forward. So more to come regarding that. Any questions? Any online? Yeah. Yes. Do you have a timeline on when the negotiations are going to be complete or a timeline? Is it going to be by the end of the year and if you could possibly implement something next year? I don't have an exact timeline based on the staff and the board is doing a due diligence quickly. Um, but based on that information, that could affect um, timelines here. So we know it's important. We're looking at our contracts, looking at a number of things involved. Uh, we're looking at the recommendations from tech. And we'll have more information we can give it at this point because we're analyzing things and there's confidentiality. We have to kind of wait till we have our next step before we can give more detail. Thank you. I'm just wondering if there's been um, feedback from agents on the showing time service. Um, we've gathered feedback over time. We had a task force last year that looked at showing services, and then we re-engaged the tech committee with all of the agents there. Um, all of them, I think, also talked to people in their offices and got feedback and things along the way. So the general direction from the board has been a showing service is valuable to our members. It's which one that we're going to be looking at and whether we continue with showing time or there's some other alternatives that we've looked at and really evaluated um, we're going to continue to finish that process and move forward, but we've, we've we've gained a lot of information over the last year just from our original task force and then the tech committee this year in reaching out. I know last year when our, our task force was formed, we invited people to send in feedback uh, on what they had regarding showing services, showing time, any of those pieces along the way, and we've taken that information as we move forward. Any other questions on that? All right, I'm going to ask Brian Ornisogan, our MLS uh, Director of MLS Technology, 
to come and talk a little bit about some cool about sheet updates. Thank you, Jim. Afternoon, everybody. Um, the project for the residential profile sheet has been completed. Uh, the task was given to the technology committee, and from there is where we discuss the best ways to help streamline the listing input process by adding and removing some of the uh, certain fields. Uh, the profile sheet um, ended up exactly matching the input within FlexMLS. That was our end goal, so we hit that 100%. Also during this process, we took the opportunity to make some very important changes to comply with the RESO standards. RESO or the Real Estate Standards Organization helps us uh, develop data standards and processes to help with uh, efficiencies with all of uh, the data within the MLS industry. Uh, by making these changes, we are now certified with RESO, which means that the MLS is leading um, the technology um, in advancements. Uh, the MLS participants and, ven and vendors have the ability to work efficiently and quickly with these uh, transitions as well. Uh, we will be sending out the new updated residential profile sheet uh, within our next uh, MLS newsletter. And you can also find a copy within the Flex MLS under the MLS intranet and available within our forms libraries within transaction desk.loopskyslope very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'm Brian and the tech committee has been busy uh, working on a lot of different things uh, for all our benefit this year. Next, I want to ask Judy Lowe to come up. So Judy's our interim CEO. We're very fortunate to have Judy. She's done some great things since she's taken over that role. And Judy's going to give us some updates on education and training. Judy. Thank you. Hi, always happy to come up with this down. <laughs> We're looking at buying a new podium, <laughs> one that is much wider and everything can be out. We had um, AV technicians here yesterday to talk about upgrading the technology for this room and our boardroom. So we're very focused on technology. But another thing that we're really focused on, and everyone here knows that it's my passion, is education. And one way to raise the bar for the professionalism for our profession is to raise the educational content, instructors, and uh, accessibility of that education. So here at TA, we have focused on our Tucson Association of Real, Real Estate Academy. We've always had a school of real estate approved by ADRE, but now we're really moving forward with a real estate academy, recognized not just within our membership, but recognized in the community as the place to uh, go for real estate education. Right now, it'll just be our members. However, we also have under our real estate academy, our leadership academy, that's divided into two sections, one being for all of our members who would like to look forward to getting involved in leadership here at the association, coming and learning how to move through what's available, what are the different committees. And then the second element will be a leadership for our elected officers and our board of directors. Kathy Wolfson here today, uh, has been working really hard with our education director, Beth Ann, uh, and we're almost at the verge of rolling those out. We also have our Affiliates Academy, where our affiliate members of our association can come and learn how to move forward in leadership and also how to interact with our members in offering their services to our membership. So three segments uh, in our Real Estate Academy. Uh, the most exciting one is our real estate education for our members. We are segmenting that out into continuing education, into professional development, 
And ultimately, we may begin to look at pre-licensing. Wouldn't it be great to have the foundation in real estate that prepares our members for doing business and protecting the consumer in the transaction, having the knowledge available? But since this is multiple listing service that we're talking about today, we also have put our Melissa training under our academy. So Amy Maloney, is Amy here? There she is in the back. Amy Maloney is our Melissa trainer. Uh, she's amazing. What does she do for us? Um, she offers office training. She'll come out to the brokerages and actually at a meeting, give office training. You have to schedule it with Amy. Uh, she will do one-on-one -on -one if an individual wants, has a question wants to know a little bit more about a showing service or how to utilize the comparables in the MLS. She'll even sit down with them and show them that. She also does classroom training. Classroom uh, training is required for our new members. We have a computer center here at the association that has really never been utilized for much other than pre-licensing testing. So when the agent does their 90 hours of pre-licensing education, they come here and utilize our test center to uh, uh, pass the Pearson View exam. Well, now we're utilizing it to do MLS training. So we also rent out that room to our brokers for them to do their computer-based education. How many uh, computers are in there? About 20, uh, Amy? Okay, between 15 and 20 computers, all of them up to date, all of them available for our members to utilize to, um, they have to reserve it and rent it. Um, they have to reserve it with Amy. She schedules all of that for the whole month at a time. So Amy is our classroom, Amy is our Zoom instructor. Um, however, now we've expanded out. We realized that um, one of our MLS techs was also a videographer. Is, I don't see Benji here. Benji's probably back answering the phone because in addition to MLS tech, he also has gotten into video. We bought some equipment. Uh, Brian has worked with them to put it together. Amy has put it together. And those are the videos that you can see at melissa.com slash education. Um, Amy will be doing some videos under the guidance of Benji. So I already see a little bit of a frown on Brian's face because he sees Benji being taken away from him. That won't happen, Brian. It's okay. Uh, but you can see some of those education sessions at our website, as well as we're even posting to YouTube. So you can go to YouTube and see those. Uh, our step-by-step -step guides are available in our education. Our class handouts we are utilizing and quick steps all included in Amy's instruction. These are our contacts. Get out your phone and take a picture of that screen and you'll have our contact information. Um, keep it in your phone. All you have to do then is hit a button and dial in and here we are to answer your questions. Our Melissa training specialist, Amy is there. Our Melissa tech support is right there. Our Melissa compliance, which is under Andrew is right there and our Melissa video library you go to YouTube for. Take out those phones again, because this is where you can register for your next class today. On July 13th, Amy is doing a Zoom class, boost your basics uh, from 9 to 10.30. And uh, take a picture of that app and you'll be able to get registered. Over on the other side, take a picture of that app and in-person class 
Booster Basics, Tuesday, July 5th, from two to four. You must bring your own laptop. Um, and we're going to be looking at um, Melissa profiles, the Melissa intranet, Melissa rules and forms, contact management, search basics around zip code area subdivision, save and email. Three different types of emails, the listing collection, the subscriptions and the portal. You can come in by, via the app. If that's too complicated, just visit our website, mlssaz.com slash calendar. And that will show you all of our Melissa training. Thank you very much. Any questions? Isn't it exciting? Everybody that thinks it's exciting, class. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you to clap one more time because this guy grew up here at the MLS. I can remember back to when Jim was on staff here and look at him now. He's the president of our multiple listing service. A round of applause for Jim. Anderson. And because I'm good at this, but uh, my staff, if everybody that's on staff for Melissa or TAR will please stand up. That's a big round of applause to our staff for what they're doing for our members uh, on a daily basis. So I just want to end by saying, please, when you call in, no matter how frustrated you are, please be kind. Thank you, Judy. All right, a couple of minutes of miscellaneous updates for you here. One thing, the AAR has come out with a new vacant land listing agreement. So that's now available on the MLS at AC Library. So once again, through your designated broker, find out the right form you should be using. If that's the form they want you to use, but that form is now in the MLS at Daisy Library for the AAR land listing agreement. The residential one has already been there and is available. As a reminder, MLS dues are due June 30th, which uh, <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, so please encourage um, other agents and your broker, everyone to get their dues paid. Because as of July 1st, there's a late fee of $75. And then once we hit the end of July, if it's still not paid, then there are suspensions that occur at that point. So asking everybody to kind of make sure we're good to go there. Uh, a couple other quick things. Committee involvement. You saw the great list of people we have participating in our committees this year. We always need feedback. So please uh, consider jumping in next year and, and volunteering for these committees. We need people from all experiences, all sizes of companies, tech people, non-tech people, new people, experienced people. All of those things make a good, well-rounded committee, which gives the greatest value to our organization to have their feedback. We're starting our strategic planning. So through Craig Thompson, our president-elect, we're beginning to look at next year and the years after. The board is engaging um, some companies to look at what is our strat planning look like. If we look out a couple of years, what do we need to do as an MLS? And we'll be reaching out to you as members to get feedback so we continue to focus on what's important to you to help you in your business. The other thing is a reminder, every month we have our broker manager leader connect. It's the first Thursday of the month at 3 p.m. So we encourage everyone to attend those. It's our chance to give updates so you know what's going on in MLS, but it's also a chance for team brokers to, to talk, get to know each other, put a face with a name, keep communication open. Everyone has been very willing to help each other and to share ideas and stories and things. And so think about taking advantage of that as well. All right, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Craig Thompson as well. He's our president-elect. This year will be president next year in 2023. And he's gonna be handling the election process. So. So I'd like to spend a few minutes and introduce uh, some of our candidates um, for the 22, uh, 2022 election for the 2023 uh, Melissa um, Board of Directors. 
Uh, this year we have several seats available. Uh, seat one, two, three, four, seven, nine, and 10 are all available this year. Um, as a reminder, only the MLS participants are allowed to cast votes for the election. Uh, the election week will start uh, July 11th. We will be sending out preview guides and candidate biographies to all the uh, participants, uh, which are the designated brokers. Uh, the election will begin midnight of the 21st of July and will finish 27th of July at midnight. Uh, so exactly seven days. And we will be announcing the election results on the 28th. Uh, so those will come out very quickly. All right, so with that said, let's get to introduce a few of these. Hold on one second. It's not clicking. Uh, yeah, I'm there. All right, we good? All right, so the qualified candidates who have applied, they have one minute to address you. Um, as I call your name, please come up and uh, give your speech or unmute yourself for those who are online. Um, so seat one, we had one eligible brokerage to field, uh, field that candidate, uh, Long Realty. We selected John, uh, Jim Adams. Uh, Jim, you wanna come up to stage? I don't think he's qualified. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again, everyone. Um, I'm honored to serve again on the MLS Board of Directors uh, in 2023. Um, a little bit about me. I do bring that unique blend of experience. I, I ran the Tucson MLS for 14 years prior to joining Long Realty. And in the last 22 years since then, I've been on the Board of Directors of the Tech Committee and I serve on AAR's Business Technology Committee. So stay very involved to help the industry move forward. Um, I'm someone that will listen. I speak up with important questions. I simplify what's complex, uh, pay attention to detail, and I'm a problem solver at heart. I firmly believe that member feedback and involvement is critical to the MLS and helping you succeed in your real estate career. So for all of you, please consider getting involved in an MLS committee or task force. The real estate community needs you. Thank you. Seat number two had one eligible brokerage to field a candidate. Here in Antigua selected Patrick Devine. Patrick, uh, I believe you're online. Maybe not. All right, we'll move forward to C3. C3 had two eligible brokerages to field a candidate. Long Realty selected Kathy Urchel. Tierra Antigua selected Amanda Elmer. Good morning. I, Kathy Urchel, am running as the director for the MLS board for 2023 through 2025. I would love to have been there in person, but the pilot refused to delay takeoff for me to attend. Ensuring all our subscribers and members' voices are heard is very important to me, and I would love to be your voice on the board. As someone that has been previously involved as a director of the MLS and TAR board, I bring historical data. In addition, having seen several different types of markets, I am able to provide great insight, which will only assist with our member-driven decision-making process. I ask for your vote. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Elmer. I'm with Tier and Tigua Realty. I am the director of HR and operations over there. Um, I'll be celebrating my 20 year anniversary this year with that amazing company. And um, I have served on the standards committee for the past six years. I was on the policy 39 task force. Um, so I've learned a ton with my committee work and task work. Um, I like looking at policies and reviewing them and making them better and seeing how we can better the association and the, and the board as well. Um, I would be honored to serve on the MLS board for 2023. So. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. C4 had two eligible brokerages. The first one, Long Realty, selected Jacob Friedman. 
Here in Tigua, selected Kelly Han. Both come up. Well, I had a few words prepared, but with Judy sitting right there, I'm in trouble. So I'll just give her this. Uh, don't need that. Um, I get it. I know. And look at your faces. I see it. You're thinking, he looks just like Thor. I get it all the time. Now, looking again, maybe I misread the room. So, uh, my name is Callahan, I'm running for MLS director. Uh, instead of me talking about all the boards and committees I've served on, I decided to help you pick the best candidate. And to do that, I picked the top five things to look for. Here we go. Number one, somebody that actually is crazy enough to volunteer for the non paying job. <laughs> Check, that's me. Someone who shows up to the meetings prepared. Check. Someone who actually speaks once in a while at these meetings, not just a pretty Thor looking wallflower. Check. Someone who believes they actually make a difference. Check. And last but not least, someone that could be fired if I don't get the job. Uh, check. <laughs> um, I do take my job seriously, but I also try to find the humor along the way. So thank you so much. That could be a tough act to follow. But uh, anyways, um, anyways, my name is Jacob Friedman. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here with you guys today. And one of my core beliefs is that if everyone gives back to their community as a whole um, and professional organizations, that will build and strengthen our community overall together. And so we will all benefit from that. Having been a part of the standards committee and chairing that and being the vice chair on the tech committee this year, um, I've created many relationships across the association and the MLS, and it's uh, given me a lot of great opportunities to get to know a lot of you in the room and online that I can't see. Uh, but uh, my diverse background in real estate, having been an agent, a broker, as also I have a technology background, uh, really gives me the knowledge to help strengthen our real estate community. And we always have an opportunity to grow our organization and move forward. And I believe as a board member, I will strive to make sure we serve our membership, but also at the same time, reinforce our community's trust in the organization. I really feel that we have those twofold purposes uh, for that. So I appreciate your consideration and wish you a great day. All right, seat number seven had four eligible brokerages to field a candidate. Russ Lyon Sotheby selected John Anderson. John, you want to come up or are you online? Oh, there he is. I'm John Anderson. I'm with Russ Lyons South of the International Realty in Tucson. I'm an associate broker there. Um, I've been doing residential bro uh, real estate since uh, my career started in 1995. You do the math, it's roughly 27 years. Uh, this is my first opportunity to be a part of the board and I very much look forward to it. And uh, I hope that I'll be elected. I had no idea that we're gonna be four other people looking for this, which is good. That's participation and that's what we want. So I hope you'll consider me and I'll look forward to hopefully working with you in the future. All right, seat number nine had 51 eligible brokerages. Of those brokerages, Remax Portfolio um, selected Andy Marino. Andy online or there? Yep, come on up. Good afternoon, all to everybody here in person and those of us with us uh, on Zoom. I am uh, Andy R. Moreno. I'm the designated broker for Remax Portfolio Homes in gorgeous Green Valley, Arizona, and I'm running for the available seat in Group 9 for the MLS uh, of Southern Arizona Board of Directors for the 2023 to 2025 term. Being on the front line and involved with the various tasks around the management of the MLS's business, regulations, and policies is important to me. I understand the great role that each board member is tasked with in ensuring that a collaborative, strong effort is put forward to uphold the standards of our profession. I'm a Southern California native, uh, but after relocating to Green Valley, Cerrita area in the summer of 2008, 
I quickly fell in love with the area and decided this would be my permanent home. I am blessed to be surrounded by a group of dedicated and goal-oriented individuals whom I am grateful to call my peers. With the ever-evolving market, its conditions, and the way that our profession continues to progress, it is crucial to me to be a voice of input in each voting matter in our local association and community. I am honored to be considered for this position. I look forward to your votes. All right, and finally, seat number 10 had two eligible brokerages um, and five brokerages submitted uh, candidates. So we have Casa Realty selected Marcella Fuentes, Desert Homes selected Maria Van Vector, Fernandez Realty selected Randy Fernandez, Help You Sell Galleria Realty selected Maria Powell, Intangible Wealth, a, real, a luxury real estate company, selected Cheryl Turpany. Guys, come on up or unmute yourself for those who are online. Not all at once. <laughs> Seriously, come on up. <laughs> So I do have a correction though. Uh, my name is Marcela Fuentes and I am the designated broker of Casas Real Estate. Um, <laughs> this election presents me with, the, with an opportunity to, sell, to serve the multiple listing service. I've served TAR quite a bit before on different committees. I'm currently the treasurer for TAR, but this is the first time that I am eligible to represent uh, MLS. So I ask for your votes. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Randy Fernandez. I've lived in Tucson for more than half of my life now. It's scary to think of that. I got my bachelor's degree and master's degree here at the University of Arizona. So I feel like I'm pretty much a native. I think that makes me a native. I did spend 25 years of my life in law enforcement and retired. And in 2016, I got my real estate license. And, and I've been working with Fernandez Realty ever since. My broker is my father-in-law, Clemente Fernandez, and I work together with my husband, David Fernandez. Um, in 2019, we got our associate broker's licenses, and I have been an associate broker with Fernandez Realty since then. As a real estate professional, different than being in law enforcement, for sure, um, I believe it's um, really important to participate with associations. I've learned that way early in my life, and I think that it helps drive the decision-making for our industry. I'm active in committees for TAR, um, the Small Broker Committee, the Risk Committee, and the TAR Home Tours. Um, Melissa, I have not had the opportunity to be a part of. So um, I hope that you all know that I will listen to you and I will speak for you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Turpany. I'm running for Group 10. And as most of you know, I am also an instructor with Hogan School and ASREB. I know I see a lot of familiar faces, so education is also at the top of my list. Uh, I have been my own designated broker, and I have been licensed for over 28 years. I'm currently now the managing broker with Tangible Wealth, a luxury real estate market here, at, uh, real estate company here in Tucson. I have served previously on MLS. I was uh, president-elect in 2018, president in 2019, treasurer in 20, vice president in 2021, and I'm currently on the standards committee with a lot of the folks that are in here. And I also worked on the task force, yay, policy 3039 to create a lot of the new things that are gonna be implemented. So I take this really, really very seriously. I currently am the chair of the risk committee, and I'm also, I serve on the forms committee and with a small broker mastermind that's through the association. So I please ask for your vote. I will hear your voice through my voice on the board. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have anyone online? The other two, Maria Powell or... Maria Van Becker, are you online? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Maria Van Becker. Good afternoon. 
This is Maria Ben Vector, designated broker and owner for Desert Home Realty. This is the I don't have the words. I'm just very uh, honored to be able to run for a director for MLS, TAR MLS. Uh, I've been serving some committees for in the last 38 years. I got my real estate license in 1984. And four years later, I decided to have my own company. So I got my broker's license and opened Desert Home Realty. Uh, since 1988 to present, I join other companies where I learn and have some work with some very nice companies. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. There is lightning very close to me. <laughs> I apologize. So um, I asked for your vote too, but I'm currently uh, serving three committees, the risk committee, the Mr. Broker, Mr. Mine, and um, I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry. We got a time anyway. So. <laughs> all right. Sorry. All right. Thank you to uh, all of our candidates. Um, and congratulations to the following candidates who were elected by acclamation. Seat number one, Jim Adams of Long Realty. Congratulations. Seat number two, Patrick Devine of Tierra Antigua. Seat number seven, John Anderson of Ross Lyon. And seat number nine, Andy Moreno of Remax Portfolio. I look forward to serving with all of you in 2023. Thank you much. Thank you, Craig, and thank you for all the people interested in running and participating in the board. It's a very valuable experience, and there's a lot that you can do for the organization and your feedback. As we wrap up here, I want to give an opportunity for what questions do you have that we haven't covered, uh, and just open the floor for anything, um, and we'll do our best to answer any questions we can for you. JT. Yeah, so what are some of the bigger challenges MLS will be facing in the ensuing year or two. So the question in case everyone didn't hear is what challenges is MLS going to be uh, facing in the next year or two? I think the advancement of technology is one as it continues to change how the business is done. Um, there are lots of challenges you run into, even with the vendors we work with, of people, there's lots of companies buying companies, uh, which create new challenges along the way. Um, it's continuing to, to evolve with uh, the rules and regulations. I think we're making some great strides in data accuracy, but we've got to continue to do that. And when we all heard the numbers from Andrew, we all gasped a little bit, which we should be. Um, so I think doing the things we're doing to get better data for all of our members is continue to be a challenge for us. Um, and really, it's just the market, the market changing and what we can do to be there supporting our members and doing what we can to assist them um, is another piece that's, that's upon us. And I, I think that's the biggest thing right now. Uh, a lot of it happens quickly. And we're going to be doing our strategic plan because we're going to get some focus on a national level. We're bringing in people who work with MLS across all the country so we can get some feedback on what other companies are doing, what are they facing, what are they doing so that we can get, share our ideas as well and make sure we're providing the best service we can. I think the other challenge we have is committee involvement. Um, we have 7,000 members of the organization and we have about 40 that are participating in committees and task force. So that's not a good ratio. We need to continue to increase that. And the challenge is obviously everyone has their own business they're doing. And this really is a second job to come in and help with the others. But the reality is it's important if we want to make sure the MLS is doing what our members need, the only way you do that is to have member feedback because staff on their own shouldn't be asked to do that. It's the members coming in and saying, here's what's going on, here's what we need, here's what's important. And for example, data accuracy was one of those. And we've made some changes and are moving forward with that. Other questions? 
I see one in the back here. As Julia mentioned about you know the YouTube videos, etc. Do do you also incorporate like uh, podcasts? Do you do so where you know you can get online and listen? I'll let Brian. Brian's going to jump on that one for us. Thank you. Excellent. Another question in the back. <laughs> Thank you for putting this on. Um, I work with investors sometimes, but in my two bedroom, one bath property, is one year later, magically, it's a four bedroom, three bath, and everything on the listing has changed. Are you going to take the old information and ding them for all the new information, or is that kind of an email saying, here's your proof? I, I think part of it, one, we're going to have a learning experience to do some of these things to begin with. <laughs> But in reality, when, when there's a difference, I think that's going to generate an inquiry. And we're going to hear back from that member to say, hey, these updates have been done. They're just not reflected at the county, whatever that might be. So that dialogue will remain open. I think the key is going to be if, if we reach out and say, this doesn't look accurate, and we never hear back, that you know that's where the new policy 39 kicks in to try and make sure we're hearing from people. But there are going to be things that are, for a reason, different. Um, and hearing back from the broker or the agent, that's going to help us understand that, know that, um, and be able to fine tune our process going forward. Other questions? Hi, Jim. Can you repeat the question and answer for the previous question? Yeah, the question. So, sorry, thank you for that. The, the previous question involved when we have um, changes that may occur, that, that there's a two, it's a two bedroom, one bath to begin with years ago. And now because of improvements or other changes at the four bedroom, three bath, um, things are going to change like that, that we may not have reflected at the county and things. And just a reminder that the, the staff will use that as a way to get the information back, understand the situation and deal with it accordingly. So uh, the idea is let's move quickly, but the idea also is let's get the right information and make sure that the members have the right information. Next. On that thing, um, I know for a fact there have been um, a number of houses that had major, major repairs done on them in order to close. And you don't see if that reflected in the, in the closing as far as the, the price. And that really messes up the uh, CMA, any kind of repair we are trying to do because an adjustment of 10, 15, to $20,000 makes a difference. How does that get addressed if at all? And I, I'm all gonna give an answer and then ask Andrew if he's got anything to add to it. but. There are fields when you report a sale for seller paid concessions, seller paid repairs. All of us should be benefiting by putting that information in. I would expect if there's some documentable information that wasn't put in, that it would be followed up on as a potential violation. Andrew, it's. Yes, yeah, so in a case like that, um, I think the first thing I would ask is if they are they just not entering in the information on the, the seller paid repairs? Okay. So then what would normally would happen is we report that as an error, then we follow up with listing brokerage, uh, take a look at some of the paperwork, see what they missed. We can update the information. Um, but yes, that, that field should be there and we should be taking advantage of it. Right, exactly. But we really were again dependent on uh, colleagues to, to point that out and report it. Yeah, there, there's there's some things that data-wise you can look at and see, but there's some that only you know. <laughs> Only you seeing an issue reporting it. So, you know, reporting it helps everyone. Um, there's the anonymity piece, um, but it's important. Another, you know, one is coming soon properties and, and all of that. There's no way for staff to know that a property is being promoted out there and it's an in. But when you see that, make sure everyone's following the same rules, um, letting staff know so they can investigate that's an important piece. I will ask, coming soon has been around for a couple of years now, but there always seems to be ongoing questions. Um, I want to make sure, does anyone have any questions about the coming soon requirements? <laughs> no, but the question would be coming soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, JP. Okay, are the actual builders going to be held responsible for the coming soon guidelines because they have signs in their yards regularly available homes that are not listed in the MLS? So the MLS rules apply to everyone that's a participant member. So 
if that participant is a member of this MLS and those properties are being advertised but not in, they would, on my understanding, would fall under the same rule. Andrew, do you have any? Yeah, so we're actually very lucky um, to have builders part of our MLS. Um, you know, not a lot of MLS actually have builders. Builders don't really need the MLS, but we're, it's, we're very, very fortunate. Um, so with that is um, clear cooperation, uh, and that's what you're talking about, is clear cooperation. That says if you're going to promote and advertise a property to the public, you have to submit that to the MLS, and it gives you one business day to do it. Uh, since uh, it was mostly focused on, that was the NAR rules. So Jim went over all those NAR rules that got passed down this year. This got passed down in uh, 2020, I believe. Um, it was focused mostly on residential properties because that's where consumers were having the hardest time. Um, so I think there needs to be more discussions whether uh, it's going to uh, apply to builders also because it was meant, mostly meant for already properties that were already built. Um, so something we can talk about in the future, at this point, builders, uh, it was, when the whole layer cooperation was implemented, there were several task forces that were put together here at the MLS. And they did talk about builders. And um, seeing on how their model is built, we understood that it was going to be very difficult for them to be able to comply with some of these some of these rules. So uh, there's a little bit of grace for for a builder. Yes, they're required to comply with our rules, but if and this is where it's great to have these elections because when we hear the feedback of this has become such a problem. Those rules can always be amended and be looked at in the future. So at this point. Um, Builders are, are not are exempt from the clear cooperation policy. I would think one thing, and Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, if they're advertising a particular home with an address as opposed to a subdivision, that might be a different issue. Uh, we'll continue to investigate that. So, good question. Thank you. Thank you. So, along those lines, I'm going to piggyback on this gentleman's question. If you have a license, uh, a realtor member who is advertised a uh, property and it's in MLS that appears as though it's already built. But when you show up on the property, it's a vacant lot. It's not a building, it's a realtor member. There's a construction status field, which should indicate whether it's already constructed or not. If that's not accurate, it would be an accurate data on the list. Okay, because it, it's showing as though it's already there. Yeah, that's why we have a construction status field. So you should, you should be able to use that. And if that is not accurate, that would be a violation of the inference. They, they just want you to see your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Judy? And I'm gonna change the subject. But I can't keep secrets. So you guys are one of the first to know. We have a new government affairs director, uh, Sean Cote from the Southern Arizona Home Builders Association. He has been their government affairs director for 13 years and we recruited him to TAR. But we did it with the blessing of David and I never can He's a good friend, but I, I can't remember his last name, <laughs> Godolowski or something like that. David, I met with him before I talked to Sean, and I got David's blessing that I could recruit David, uh, uh, Sean. So Sean will begin August 1st. He also already knows the challenges that we're having with the integration of new homes into our multiple listing service. He will help us walk through how to better define that and implement it, because we really need uh, to have access to the new home uh, projects and inventory that are available. So now you guys know more than anybody else out there. <laughs> Just share the news, it's exciting, and we're, we're really glad to be able to announce that. That's great. <laughs> 
<laughs> I remember when we were desperately trying to get the builders to put their information in and all that, and how they bought us and drugged their feet. And I'm just thrilled that they're there, and I hope we can tread lightly. <laughs> Thank you. Good feedback. All right. Anything else? Anybody online that has a question they want to ask? Very quiet. Well, it looks like we're ending right on time. We have time 11.30 to 1. I really appreciate everyone in person that came down to see us. Everyone online, thank you for your participation. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you.